Welcome back to Module 3. Uh, recall that under GNSS signals, we were having some fun. We were exploring, on the one hand, utility of frequency domain analysis. Uh, but I don't want to get totally away from time domain analysis. It's also so important. And in fact, it will be the central topic here when we talk about autocorrelation and cross-correlation. Last time we talked a little bit about how nice it was that when the receiver, the user equipment, correlates the replica with the received, it spreads any narrow band radio frequency interference that's included in there. But let's go back to the real uh, other, well, the other utility of that correlation in the receiver, and we'll talk about the good properties of the codes which have been designed on the one hand to have a very sharply peaked autocorrelation function, which helps us know when we're tracking the desired satellite, and which helps us measure time of arrival very, very precisely. And the additional property that we'll be interested in is cross-correlation, that when we take the replica for satellite, let's say six, with uh, the received signal for satellite five, there's no peak at all. And so th these codes have been designed to have very sharp correlation peaks with themselves, autocorrelation, and very low correlation with any of the other satellite signals, cross-correlation. Let's have a look. So I think we've gone over this figure before, but it's well worth uh, repeating and enjoying again. What we have at the top is the received code buried in noise. The noise is much stronger than that received code. It's down in that received RF signal somewhere. Within the receiver, we have any number of replicas. Here I draw only two, but some modern receivers have a million replicas that they're just candidating forward, putting forward as uh, correct alignments with the received code. Let's stick to two. Notice that when we are time aligned and we do correlation, all the plus ones align, all the minus ones aligned, and we get a very strong correlation because correlation sums the products. So the products are these individual plus and minus one uh, multiplications. And as we do many of those, let's say a thousand of them over the course of one CA code, we add up all those products. And when they're aligned, we get a thousand plus ones added together. And so we get a very strong autocorrelation. <clears throat> when our replica isn't perfectly aligned, it has slid off, it's late. Now, our plus ones are sometimes finding plus ones here and here, but this third plus one is finding a minus one, and this minus one is finding a minus one, but that plus one is finding a minus one, and what happens on average is that the correlation is zero, and so we see that by going down to this point here. As the replica wanders later and later, let's say, we hope for and generally get an autocorrelation function that stays low. Now, it turns out it's not as perfect as it's shown there. This is our wish, and we almost get our wish. What we do get are small side side lobes like that. But here's the goal. Let me show you the autocorrelation function for a real uh, code, give you a little better feeling. Here we go. Here's the time delay in chips. And so this means uh, zero means aligned. And notice that we have normalized the correlation peak. It's really 31 agreements divided by a length of the code, which is 31. <clears throat> and then we get side lobes. So this is equal to 1. Down here, slightly negative is negative 1 over 31. 
negative 9 over 31, and then 7 over 31. Now you may comment. You may say, well, that's not really the brilliant autocorrelation function that we sought. In the best of all worlds, we would have had more discrimination between the peak and these side lobes. But it turns out that GPS, for example, uses an n equal to 1,023. And in that case, this peak is much stronger than the side lobes that appear below. Let's have a look at that. Here we go. <clears throat> Here are the actual levels for the GPS CA code. n equals to 1,023. If we normalize to 1 here, then the side lobes become relatively much smaller. We have 63 over 1,023, or only 0.062, so 6% of the main peak. Then we have minus 1 over 1,023, 0.001, so only 0.1% of the peak. And then finally down here below, we have something at 6.4% of the peak. Generally speaking, this is fine, and it has given amazing utility to the CA code for GPS. This is the operation that goes on over and over again in your smartphone, and this is the property that really drives it forward. Um, occasionally, you may have a situation where one satellite is strongly blocked by a building, and so the amplitude associated with this whole thing is attenuated by a building, and in that case, you can fall prey to a little bit of cross-correlation with a satellite, even though it's not the one that you're seeking, its signal is much stronger by virtue of the fact it's not blocked by any building. Let's take a look at that situation. So here, we talk about cross-correlation side lobes. Notice there's no main peak. We're grateful for that. That would, that would have been a shame if all of a sudden there was a big, strong correlation between, let's say, satellite 6 and satellite 7. But the so-called cross-correlation side lobes are uniformly low. Here we have the 63 over 1,023 the minus 1 over 1,023, the minus 65 over 1,023. Note that the cross-correlation values are the three non-unity autocorrelation values. So that's a nice feature, a remarkable number theoretic outcome of the gold codes which are used by GPS. The other uh, thing that you may wonder is, well, uh, this kind of sounds like you're counting on these sequences to be like coin flipping sequences, heads and tails. And indeed, these codes are called pseudo-random codes. Because especially with respect to cross and autocorrelation, they do resemble coin flipping sequences. And so if we were to just flip a coin, and every time it came up heads, say that's a plus one, every time it came up tails, say that's a minus one, and build the GPS codes that way, we could at least take the expected value and the standard deviation of the side lobes. The expected value would be zero, and the standard deviation would be shown right here. So plus and minus one standard deviation around the mean of zero would give us side lobes that were more or less bouncing between this level here and this level here. Of course, since these are random sequences, there would be outliers out here somewhere and out here somewhere. But notice that these standard deviations are pretty good predictors of the worst case, and in fact, only values of the cross-correlation for the true CA codes. So I hope you've enjoyed this journey 
into the correlation properties of the GPS codes, please know that those codes are, and those properties are key to all the new satellite navigation signals as well. So we put them pretty strongly in the frame of GPS because that's where the examples are very present and have high utility, but the discussion is applicable to Galileo, Beidou, GLONASS, etc. Thank you for your time.